Hello. Um, I like food, and I like local food. They're good things. I go around talking about it for my job, and I also um, talk to my neighbors about it, and fellow uh, agricultural professors at the, at the college. And I get a reaction. You know, maybe you're one of these people that just saw um, Burke's video, and you're like, yeah, you know, local food, organic food tastes good probably, you know, really healthy for you, but let's get real. You know, it's not going to feed everybody, and it's not going to be affordable to everybody. Um, this disturbs me because usually when I'm in conversation, I don't have 10 minutes to describe, you know, a lock-solid case of why we need to develop a local food system now. But I have a captive audience here tonight, so you're going you're gonna to hear it. This is, this is it. And I'm going to talk about oil now, so stay with me here. I'll get back to food here in a minute. Um, this is a graph of oil production. If you had to talk about food, you gotta talk about oil. And the, the bar graphs there are uh, oil discoveries through time. And the line there is oil production. What do you have to know about oil industry is uh, once you find one field, discover it, start poking holes in the ground and bringing the oil out, it takes generally about 40 years for that field to come up, that one field to come up to peak production. And then after that, it goes down for about 40 years until it runs out. That's the natural progress of one field. So oil experts have really looked at the, the discovery data, and um, it's not you know, rocket science to figure out, by looking at the discovery data, when global oil is going to peak. And a while ago, they said, you know, they made an estimation it would probably peak in around 2003 to 2015. And it seems to be right. Um, you know, in the last five years, since 2005, oil, global oil production has peaked. No matter how high price goes, that goes up to $151 a barrel. It didn't bring on any further production. And really what we can expect from here is a steady decline. Other alternative energies are going to come in and make up for that but, uh, somewhat. But nothing is ever going to make up for this huge mother load we see that we discovered there. It was the greatest gift that the past has really ever given us in a, in a way. Um, and this is going to affect every part of our life. It's going to affect you know, what we drive, how we drive, what we do for a living, how we design cities, um, how we think about the growth economy in general. But the one thing I'm going to talk about tonight is how this is going to affect food. Because um, the food you guy buy in the grocery store, we've, we've made great use of this oil, this, this gift from nature over the last 100 years. And we really transformed our agricultural system. So now, um, you know, 99% of us are not farmers. Less than 1% of us actually grow the food. This wasn't always the case in 1920. Uh, that was within one human lifetime ago. 50% of us Americans were, were farmers, lived on farms. And at that time, the, the energetics of a farm were different. And um, this is the energy returns on food people have figured out, that the scientists have looked at. And a farm, like at the farm gate in 1920, all the energy going in there and machinery and, and, and uh, um, fertilizers was accounted for going into the farm gate and then all the food coming out, the metabolizable energy. And the ratio is one energy unit going in equals three units going out. And that's really the way it's been since the dawn of agriculture 10,000 years ago. Agriculture was an energy production system. Um, that, but it changed since then. And so today, the farm, you put one calorie into the farm gate and because of all the, uh, the fossil fuel intensive um, things that uh, Burke was talking about we get about one unit out of the farm. But what's really shocking is what happens after it leaves the farm and goes to processing and transporting, refrigeration, slaughtering, and, and cooking into, into our st stomachs. And that whole system adds a lot more energy to the system. So, so the food on your plate, there's seven calories of energy in there for every one calorie of food you actually ingest. And that's what, really what we have to reverse in light of the, of the depleting energy production. Um, and so how are we going to do that? Fortunately for us, there was a laboratory south of our border called Cuba. Um, <laughs> it was a peak oil laboratory. In 1990, the Soviet, their, their trading partners dissolved. They didn't see it coming, and they had a 20% drop in uh, available energy in one year. Boom. Well, the uh, calorie intake of the average Cuban went from 3,000 calories to 2,000 calories overnight. By 1993, three years later, uh, the average Cuban had lost 20 pounds of weight. And at that point, they knew they had a problem. And they're like, 
what are we going to do about this? And so they called up the uh, permaculturalists from Australia. And permaculture is basically a, a sustainability science, um, how to grow food with energy, without a whole lot of energy. And the permaculturists set up there, and they, they did a lot of lessons on how to make soil, how to use worms, how to compost, how to do cover crops, how to integrate um, livestock with, uh, with crops. And the Cubans spread, spread their messages around, and they did a couple other things. They unleashed the free market. They uh, let people have ownership over their, what they grow and make a profit on it. And they put, opened up a whole bunch of land in the city itself, in Havana. Um, and uh, they, they put, actually, the agriculture close to where the mouths were and where the waste streams were. And this was key, but um, so by 1998, a few years later, the Cubans were gaining weight again. <coughs> and now in uh, Havana, a city of uh, a couple million people, I believe, three million people, 50% um, of all fruits and vegetables consumed within the city are produced in the city itself. So they, they saved themselves. They, they, brought, they brought themselves back from the abyss. So back to the United States, to our situation right now. I don't think we really have to wait for a crisis. Cuba didn't see it coming. We had the advantage of seeing it coming. Um, what we can do now is invest in local food systems right now, and that, that green line by investing in uh, slaughterhouses, by buying from CSAs, by uh, buying at the, at the farmer's market, um, by supporting our local food system, or our, our, our local school system is starting to buy local. We can really uh, increase the supply and demand of local food now. So in five or 10 years, when that industrial food starts to go way up in price, we have everything in place here, and we're beating the system, and we're, we're, we're still feeding our population. So um, that's really the simple message I, I wanted to tell you tonight. But um, <coughs> it's kind of ominous. You know, I, I think I just told you guys to uh, you know, start a slaughterhouse, and that's probably not <laughs> feasible for, <laughs> for most of you. So um, my advice is, you know, everybody should really start small. Get your hands dirty, you know, know where the sun is, know where the direction south is. And this is something I've done in my backyard for several years. Um, this is kind of how I got into actually the, um, the non-theory part of, of agriculture. It's, you can, people don't know in Knoxville that winter is a great time to grow greens. And you can grow greens all winter long. It takes some hay bales in the back there, some old windows, and you face them south, plant your seeds, <coughs> you water it, and you can even plant, like, if you hurried home and plant tomorrow, you can have uh, some greens for Christmas dinner, probably. Maybe, you might have to wait a couple of weeks longer, because it really slows down with the sun disappearing uh, this time of year. But um, it's a good, good way to, to get your hands dirty and get into it. And when you're doing this, uh, yeah, you're learning how to grow food, but also try to substitute. Try to win the energy game. Like, uh, if you don't have windows... Don't go out and buy a new windows. Don't run to Lowe's to go, go buy everything. Um, you know, you, you can just go run the store and buy lettuce if you wanted to do that. So to try to improvise. You know, find old windows. Uh, if you don't have straw bales and you don't want to sp spend the money or the energy to, to get straw bales, maybe uh, some old boards and pile up some leaves on the back of it for insulation on the back. You know, uh, what you're doing is you're, you're training your mind to see opportunities and uh, to get by. And that, that's the most important lesson about starting small like this. And so, yeah, keep your eyes open. So you're keeping your eyes open in your small little project, and once you start that, uh, you can start to look around. And you can, in, in Knoxville here, we have a lot of people that are doing small things now. Uh, chickens are now legal in the city, as there, there are in a, in a lot of cities around the United States. And uh, people are planting fruit trees, they're starting community gardens, starting gardens in their backyard. So once you get into it, you can start seeing these people. We need to start trading with each other, uh, buying from each other, selling to each other. And together we can uh, you know, slowly build our local food system and uh, get on it. And I wanted to end with this slide because I've been talking about a lot of doom and gloom things tonight. But you can see that uh, there's a lot of smiling faces here. And it has uh, these local food advocates um, have an extra side effect of happiness and uh, pleasure, too. Thank you.